It's Wednesday, April 10th, 2024. It's a busy day here in Fayetteville. Matt Jones with Bubba Carpenter. We may talk a little basketball today on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. We'll see. We'll also talk about the number one ranked Arkansas baseball team, their sweep over Ole Miss, and their upcoming series against Alabama. But first, a word from our sponsor. Kendall King, where it's all about teamwork. Building brands around a design concept, Kendall King takes pride in their skill sets and displays and signing, as well as dot-com photography, content creation, and influencer marketing. The bases are loaded, and the Kendall King team is bringing it home. This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Kendall King, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball, featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's your host, Matt Jones. Well, good morning. It is a busy day here in Fable, as we mentioned a minute ago. A lot going on with John Calipari, hired as the Razorback basketball head coach. They're going to introduce him tonight over at Bud Walton Arena. It's an open event if you want to go. It, uh, you can get in the building at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. That will be when the festivities start. Bubba, you got any thoughts on John Calipari to Arkansas? You know what? I'm excited. I really am, Matt. Um, you know, he's a coaching legend. legend. Um yeah, I mean, I think the thing I like about it the most is I've heard him say, like in the past, mm-hmm. he's been quoted multiple times saying that, you know, he he likes Arkansas. He 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 just there's something about it. Like he has a, he, he kind of has a love for here. And this was long before there was talk of him being a coach here. Mm-hmm. So I, for me, that goes a long way. You know, Bo Mattingly posted a clip yesterday when when Bo was doing his radio show. He had John on, I think, in 2011, and they talked about, uh, you know, seven. Calipari had inter- – I don't know if it was really an interview, but he had discussed the Arkansas job with Frank Broyles. And, you know, he just kind of talked at that time. It wasn't the right move for him to go to Arkansas because the next year was when he had his national <clears throat> championship run at Memphis. They didn't win the championship, but they, they went to the championship game. So, I don't know. I think the proximity, obviously being in Kentucky, when they come to Bud Walton Arena, I mean, he gets to see the best of the arena. <laughs> and that's how uh, – I mean, when you're coaching in Kentucky, that's how it is. You go on the road, you're going to get the best and, and – I mean, I I can see why he's impressed with the job. Yeah, I mean, what a job so. by Hunter Juracek to pull that off when people thought that it was maybe not going to be a great hire. Yeah, I mean that's you know hats off to him. You know, I think Hunter gets some some criticism sometimes, but I mean he always he always comes through for mm-hmm. us. I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge Hunter Juracek fan. I really am. I always have been. Um, I like how he supports all the sports, not mm-hmm. just the main sports, but man, that guy's everywhere. He's all over the place, and I I, I just think that he's a a huge, you know, I don't know, he's just a, a huge value to the Razorback athletic program. Well, putting this in a baseball perspective, I mean, you, you've heard Dave Van Horn talk about the first meeting that he had with Eurotech, or kind of the first sit-down meeting they had. He came over to Bomb Stadium, and they went on a kind of a walking tour of the stadium, and they went back up to Dave's office, and, and Hunter sits down and says, this isn't good enough. Uh, if you're trying to win championships, you need more. And that's kind of what laid the foundation for the Hunt Center. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's been very good for the programs, I think. Yeah. I love seeing him when he comes baseball, out to Baum Walker. Sure. I yeah. love it when he comes out there. And He was at Baum last night. I think he was trying to keep a low profile because <laughs> he knew what was coming today. <laughs> All right, let's get into last night's game. Arkansas beat San Jose State 5-1. to one. Uh, You know, I mean, it's kind of like Arkansas sticks to the script, I feel like, in a lot of their games. They yeah, get a really so. good starting pitching performance. They get just enough offensively, you know, a big inning here and there, and respondability, the word that we've coined here. Uh, They had it last night against San Jose State. San Jose State hits a homer off Ben Bybee in the top of the second inning. Arkansas comes back in the bottom of the second. Peyton Stovall has an RBI single. Nolan Souza has an RBI double. They had a couple of walks in the inning. Walks have been huge for this team, and a couple of solo homers, really great bullpen performance, rinse, wash, and repeat, and that's kind of been Razorback baseball in 2024. Uh, you're right, Matt. And, and, you know, we said it after they hit the home run, we come up in the bottom half of the second, and I said something about it. I didn't use your word. Um, you should have. Responsibility. I need, I need to do that. I need to, <laughs> and I'll give you credit for it. I'll give you props for sure. But, you know, I said something. I said, well, we'll see. You know, this is – we've been really great at answering back. Let's see mm-hmm. if we'll answer back right here. And sure enough, you know, we throw, up a, we throw up a crooked number, and that's what this team's been so good at. And, I mean, it's something that's special within that team and the dugout in that lineup, the, the ability to do that. And other teams other teams don't do it like that, uh, you know, at, inning after inning, like we continue to do. It's what makes great teams, the ability to, to answer back. Oh, absolutely. Um, and like I said, some teams have the ability to do it, some don't. And when a team makes a mistake, 
we take advantage of it. And I've said that all along. There's something special about this group of players mm-hmm. where they're able to do that. If you're in the opposing dugout and you go ahead, you know, one to nothing, three to one, whatever the case may be, we've seen different variations of this, and they come back and they score two runs in the next inning or three runs in the next inning, is that a little bit demoralizing? It really is. Every time you score, if the other team answers back, it really is. It's uh, it's tough, and it's really tough for the pitcher out there on the mound. You know, I said last night when Aloy hit the home run to right field, I mean, that was a pitcher's pitch. That's a fastball. Banged off Dave Van Horn's window. I don't oh know if you noticed that. God. Yeah, That was his office. Saw. That was they a bomb. A this morning. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bomb. Yeah. Any guy, when you can hit a ball that far to opposite field, and it was a pitcher's pitch. It wasn't a meatball down the middle. That ball was an outside corner, mm-hmm. top of the zone, and boy, Aloy crushed it, and he knew it the minute he hit it. You know, and I said something to Nate, you know, after the game, Nate Thompson, he's like, yeah, is that special? That's really special to be able to drive a ball that way to the opposite field. I mean, mm-hmm. I say all the time, guys can pull balls 400-something feet, but that's that's true power to be able to drive the ball opposite field like that. Arkansas and San Jose State are supposed to play today at 1 o'clock. It was originally scheduled for 3. I don't know if they're going to be able to. Uh, we'll see. They've moved it up because they think there might be a window there weather-wise where they can do it, but... It's an awfully rainy day here in, in Fayetteville. You just came in. It doesn't look great for baseball right now. It doesn't look good. But, you know, at 1 o'clock it shows rain moving in, but mm-hmm. we'll see. I mean, you look at yesterday. I would have never thought we'd have played yesterday. Yeah, it showed right. rain all day, and, you know, in the middle of the day the sun's out. So who knows? If Arkansas goes today, they're going to pitch Colin Fisher, the left-hander, uh, the freshman who's been really good for them in midweeks. Uh, uh, they threw Ben Bybee last night, and I thought Ben looked phenomenal. 55 pitches in five innings. He gives up two hits. I don't think he walked a batter, had a few strikeouts. He looked to me like what we had heard Ben Bybee was going to look like throughout the offseason. You know, he had a big summer out in California, looked pretty good in the fall practices, had looked good in the preseason before he had a little bit of a hamstring injury. And then he has the mono and can't pitch for three, four, five weeks. I don't know what the, the number was, but uh, – that looked really good, and, and it's almost like an embarrassment of riches with them from a starting pitching standpoint that you got Bybee and Fisher, who I think in past years would have been weekend starters for the Razorbacks, and you get to use them on Tuesday and Wednesday. That's an advantage no one else has. I mean, you probably know this, but but at the finish of last night's game, our Tuesday night ERA was 2.02, incredible. Yeah. which is incredible. I, I, now, I didn't look across – college baseball, but I can't imagine another team with a better Tuesday night ERA than that. And I mentioned it to Ben after the game. He was the player of the game, and I mentioned to him. And I said, you know, I asked him, I said, do you feel like you're getting stronger every time out? And he's like, absolutely. I feel better every time out. And, you know, the thing that stands out to me about him is, you know, you see him as this big 6'6", 240-pound guy, like more of a power guy. But I tell you what, if you watch him throw that changeup, he's got such a good feel for that changeup. And, uh, you know, you don't see a lot of guys that are able to do that. And that's a great weapon to get those lefties out. You see a ton of weak contact to the right side on that changeup. And Ben told me last night that he's 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 trying to start throwing it more righty-righty, which I think is awesome because he's getting – he's not just getting – he said the difference in this year's changeup and last year's, last year he got more run on it. Now he's getting more vertical sink on it. So you can throw that to a righty and get a little, you know, a chopper to third base, get an d- easy double play you know, get a one pitch out. So I think that ability to have confidence in that pitch right there, the change up, everyone wants to throw like, And he said he learned it at a young age, Matt. Mm-hmm. And he said that was his main off-speed pitch when he was younger. And I, I hope everyone out there is listening that has a kid that wants to teach him a curveball. Everyone wants to teach your kid a curveball. Teach him a good change up <laughs> because that change up makes all his other pitches better. I don't know what the number was against Arkansas State. I know against UALR a couple of weeks ago, they had a strike percentage of 72% on their Tuesday night game. Last night it was 73%. Their last three midweek games, I would assume Arkansas State was in that 70% range. Their last three midweek games, two-hitter, one-hitter, two-hitter. Now, a couple of those were run rule games, but what they're getting on Tuesday night is spectacular. And it really sets them up well for the weekend, too, because a lot of teams have to go dig into their weekend pitching Right. on Tuesday night to get through it, and especially if you got a Tuesday-Wednesday series. I don't know, even if they play today, if they're going to have to touch a pitcher uh, who they would expect in, in what I would call a prominent role on the weekend. Now, I think you can see Christian Fouts on the weekend. I mean, he looks phenomenal right now. But you don't have to go get a Will McIntyre and ask him for an right. inning or two on a Tuesday. And, and that's uh, that, that's 
incredible to me. Well, it's a huge luxury to have, and you know that's why we haven't lost a Tuesday game. <laughs> you know, to, yeah. to be honest with you, and you look at look at the other teams around the SEC that's struggling on Tuesdays, and you look at what we're doing. I mean, we're just we're you just said it right there. We're dominating on Tuesdays, and that's you know it's a great luxury to have. And and I told Ben after the game, I said, you know, I didn't. I, it's not that I didn't not look forward to Tuesday night games, but I didn't I didn't go into Tuesday night games in the past as excited as I am now. Mm -hmm. When I go into a Tuesday night game now, I'm I'm excited because I'm getting to see studs out there on the mound. I'm getting to see guys like Ben Bybee throw, uh, Colin Fisher, and I'm getting to see guys come off the bench and play. Like I was excited to see Jason Jones last night, Peyton Holt, um, you know. Hudson Polk, some of those guys in the lineup last night. I was excited to see those guys get in there and get a chance last night. I liked watching Sousa play third. So I go into Tuesday night almost as excited as a weekend just because mm -hmm. you get to see there's there's guys that I want to see play, and you get a chance to see them. It's a good development night. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Ole Miss. Arkansas sweeps that series. They went 5-3, 8-3, 7-4. It was a competitive series, but then again, it never really felt like Arkansas was in any danger of, of losing any of those games. They they just made plays. They they did. Um, you know, you look at the way the game started out on Thursday night. You know, we got behind. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Riley Maddox had that had the two seam fastball going. I said to Phil, and I think we're going in the sixth inning. I think we're down two to one in the sixth mm -hmm. inning. That's right. And I said, look, I feel like we've got these guys right. We want them. You know, we're Hagen Smith is still out there. We got a fresh Will McIntyre in the bullpen. Um, this guy's about out of pitches. I didn't see anyone in their bullpen that could really shut us down. Mm. Like, they don't have that shutdown type guy. Mm -hmm. um, and we go out in the bottom of the sixth, score a couple runs, and it's a whole new ball game. And so, well, they got the, the, the top of the lineup up against Maddox for the third time. And I thought yeah. that was the, the key is that they had seen that a couple of times and they knew how to attack him. I think so. I think, you know, you see. Uh, you see Peyton Stovall work a three two three two walk, and then four straight pitches to to Ben McIntyre mm -hmm. or Ben uh, McLaughlin, McLaughlin out of the zone, and then you know uh, Vahiva comes up and does Vahiva type things. You know? <laughs> yes. So I mean it was a, it's a crazy how fast the game can turn though. But mm -hmm. that's that's his lineup, and that's that third time through these guys make adjustments. Sometimes it it just takes once. Sometimes it takes a couple times to see that. You can game plan for that two seam fastball and you you know, you don't see that a lot. In today's game, everything's about carry. High carry at the top of the zone, high carry at the top of the zone. This guy was pretty good at the bottom of the zone. He was leaving everything right at the knees, mm -hmm. didn't make a lot of mistakes, and you know, but that third time through we made the adjustment. It was good to see. I'm glad you saw it because I didn't see it. I I thought Maddox was about to throw a Maddox. I mean, he was incredible. Uh, fifty five pitches through five innings. I I openly you know ask it's like are, is he going to throw a complete game tonight are they going to have to get into their bullpen and then it it, it changed in a hurry well uh, it's it's our lineup I think early on we were swinging at it we were getting you know so when you when you face a two seam guy if that ball starts at the thighs mm -hmm. or below the belt you got to let it go because it's going to end up at the knees and the job of that pitch is to get you out you have to hunt the ball up and I think early on we were seeing balls coming in at the belt and we're swinging at them, they end up at the knees. Well, those are ground ball outs. It's mm. it's hard. Righties were getting jammed. Lefties were hitting it off the end of the bat to the right side, weak ground balls. But after you see it a couple times, and like, you, you can simulate it all you want on the eye pitch machine or, you know, you can read a scouting report. But until you step in the box and see that pitch, it's it's different, Matt. And I think it just takes a couple times for you to see it. And the one thing that did worry me, like you said, is a lot of quick outs. Mm -hmm. We're facing a guy like that. I'd, I'd like to see our guys take more pitches early in the game because he will make a mistake. You know, I, I was talking to Phil uh, a few days ago, and I said, look, I think the biggest mistake that, that hitters do is they game plan for a guy's best pitch. Mm -hmm. You don't want a game plan for that two seam fastball at the knees because the job of that pitch is to get you out. You're you're not going to hit. I don't care how good you are. It's hard to it's hard to drive that pitch. You got to hunt him up in the zone, and so let him make a mistake. How about the weekend the Hawaiian boys had Souza and Aloy? Even going back to Arkansas State last week, it was four straight games where one of them hit a home run. You could make an argument that they were the player of the game each night that that they played mm -hmm. last week. Probably Sousa against Arkansas State, Aloy the first two games of the Ole Miss game, and then Sousa was incredible in game three with, with five RBI. Everybody focuses on the home runs. 
the hit I loved was the shift beater, the single that that makes it three to two. It was it, it was awesome. It was a two strike pitch and yeah. goes the opposite way. It it was it was a thing of beauty. I said the same thing. I said, look, people hear me talk all the time. I love when a guy gets into one, hits one four hundred feet. I like that swing more. And I'll tell you what, that swing, Matt, pulling his hands inside that fastball and shooting it to the left side, getting a two strike RBI. Um, in a big point of the game, got him that fastball later in the game that he mm. could hit up halfway up the scoreboard. Mm. And, you know, you just can't shift against a, a, a Souza. He's just – he's too good. Um, but What's his ceiling? Oh, It geez. looks really high to it's me. It's high. It's it's so high. I mean, he's got, he's got everything. He's got a good, strong arm. He's fast. He's strong. He's athletic. He hits for power. Mm -hmm. He showed the ability to hit for average. I don't know that there's a tool that he doesn't possess. He looks like, uh, you know, because uh, he's left-handed, I think of Kendall Diggs, but he looks like a more polished version of Kendall Diggs that is a freshman. Yeah. And do you realize how big he is? He's huge. I you mean, don't realize it, I think, until you're standing next to him. But, yeah. And it almost looks like he could grow a little bit more. Oh, he's going to. When he fills out just a little bit more in that frame, he's going to even have more power. I mean, he's hitting balls right now. Early in the year, a pitch that stood out, I want to say, um, shoot, I don't even remember which game it was. He took a fastball down and away, mm -hmm. right in the bottom corner of Trackman, and hit it 108 to was left field. Was the Missouri field. game? Might have been the Missouri game. Might have been. But it was a pitcher's pitch down and away. He hit it 108 to left field, hit the base of the wall. And, mm. and I'm like, wow, that pitch isn't supposed to be hit that hard. Just like the ball that Aloy hit, you know, off of DVH's office. It's not supposed to be hit that <laughs> far by a college kid. I'm sorry. It's just not. So – it's fun. I was going to bring a lay in and, and put around, <laughs> but I, I I couldn't find one last who, minute. It who was, we got today? Has that, that been intended? Yeah, we have been intending. And, and I did that because in honor of the offense, I thought the offense came through and had some really big, timely hits. And so I went with Ben Attendi today. So it's Golden Spikes Award there on the bottom. I, yeah. I guess Kevin Copps is next. We talked about this last week. Who's next for a bobblehead? Copps would be next. Maybe Hagen Smith after that. I mean, the Golden Spikes mm -hmm. Award midseason came out the other day. He's one of the, the, 45 on the watch list for the midseason. I would say he's probably one of the three or four top candidates for it right now. Caglione, yeah. Charlie Condon would be in that conversation. Uh, Bazana at, at Oregon State's having a huge year. But pitching-wise, yeah. I don't know if anybody's having a bigger year than Hagen is. I think if we voted today, I think it'd be Hagen. I really do. And, I mean, just his numbers are incredible. He's still striking out over 50% of his mm. his batter's faced. I mean, which is – that's unheard of. I don't know what the percentage is now. I know a few weeks ago, I think – the rest of the country was striking out just under 20%. Mm -hmm. And Hagen's at 50%. That's that's remarkable. If you're listening to this on the audio version, you cannot see the Andrew Benintendi bobblehead that's that's sitting here between us. That's that's what we're talking about. You know, when Cops won the Golden Spikes, he was not on the midseason award watch list. That, that's, that's the most incredible thing to me yeah. because you could say that that's the most dominant season a reliever maybe has ever had in college baseball. But it really wasn't until – you know, maybe the first or second weekend of April after that watch list had come out that you started really seeing them stretch him out and pitch him a couple of times a weekend. And that it, it took a few weeks to realize, hey, there's something really special going on there with this guy. And the ascent after that was just remarkable. Yeah, I mean, he got on a stretch there where he was he was basically unhittable. He was about as automatic as I've seen in college baseball ever. Well, he is. It, it was the – it was the best, the most mm -hmm. dominant I've seen a college pitcher ever uh, when he was rolling there, you know, starting about, yeah, I don't want, even before midseason on. I mean, it was yeah. incredible. I remember the, the series against Auburn. He pitched twice, and I think that was the first weekend of April. That was the one that, uh, that I remember. How about I test your music knowledge? What was Kevin Copp's walkout song called? Okay, see, I don't know because when <laughs> I have the headset on, I can't. I can't, you can't hear, hear it. I can't hear the the walkout music on the head on the. Would you know it even if you could hear it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna sing it to me? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm not gonna torture anyone with that. Uh, it's called uh, Heat Waves by I think Glass Animals. But anyway, uh, you know when that music would hit, there was just this buzz that would go. It's kind of like uh, you know like when you used to watch pro wrestling. You know, like the the theme would hit and then everybody would kind of react. It's kind of like that, you know, the, the, the song would start and there would be this buzz that went throughout the stadium. I'm feeling that a little bit with Will McIntyre right now. That's just where I'm going with this. When that music hits, Return of the Mac, he starts coming out, 
it's kind of like, hey, people are getting excited about it. And I almost wonder what the other, you know, dugout's thinking. It's like because he's he's not unhittable, but he's been pretty darn good this year. I tell you, he's been pretty close to unhittable. I mean, he really has. Given up a couple weak hits, hadn't given up really anything hard. Um, but it's it's similar, it really. And the is. first time he's really really good. The second time, mm-hmm. I think, is when they're having a little bit more success against him, which isn't surprising. Yeah, but the thing the thing is, you look at our catchers. I've given our catchers a whole lot of credit because you can tell when a guy's sitting off speed on that cutter. Mm-hmm. Will's cutter, let's say it, it it's about eighty four miles an hour typically. Mm-hmm. When he came in the second time on Saturday, it was it was uh, eighty one, eighty two, through a couple eighty three. It was a little bit slower, um, but still just as fe- as effective. But you can tell when a guy's sitting off speed. Our catchers do a great job of seeing when they're sitting off speed. A guy will load late, he'll stride late. Mm-hmm. His his cadence is just a little bit later, his rhythm, his tempo. So what they do is they call a fastball. And when they call that 90-mile-an-hour fastball, that 90-mile-an-hour fastball looks like 110 if you're sitting on an 84-mile-an-hour cutter. So, Would you ever wear Ole Miss powder blue jerseys? No, I mean, not, they don't have to say Ole Miss across them. Just powder. The powder blue is a uh, – it's a uh, – fad i guess right now in in baseball a lot of people are going to powder blues well okay i tell you what i I gotta be i gotta be honest we're partners with uh arkansas prospects out of out of little rock do you have powder blue jerseys um andy menard has a powder (laughs) blue jersey and i'll tell you matt the kids love it when i first said when we we've we've been we've been sharing players for years and andy menard does a great job on the little rock side you're like you look at guys mm-hmm. like caden wallace oh, yeah. uh, jackson Wiggs, they all martin. they played i mean yeah. i mean casey martin they, those guys have all like i used to have a joke with casey and uh um caden wallace where i'd i would i'd pull my shirt down like that and i'd show them <laughs> i wore i wore a prospect shirt under my whatever whatever razorback shirt i wore yeah. that day okay. and casey would do the same thing sometimes okay. and so he always made sure i had you know he felt like if i had it on he had a good day so t- long story short is they have a powder blue jersey that they wear for the prospects. Now, our colors are kind of black and red, um, but the kids love that powder blue uniform. And so I'm having a hard time, but the kids love it. And so therefore, this summer, we're going to have we're going to have prospect kids wearing a powder blue. Does, I sh- does, should not have admitted that. As a coach, <laughs> do you wear do you wear the same uniform the kids are wearing? No, I do not. Would you do it? I want to get a picture of you in powder blue. That's, you that's will, where I'm going. I, I got to go out on a limb and say, you will never see me with a powder <laughs> blue uniform on. And I'm sorry. I love my kids. I love coaching. I love Andy Menard. I love the program he's built in Little Rock. I love everything about it. You will not see me with powder blue jersey on. If Arkansas wins a baseball national championship, will you wear a powder blue jersey this summer? Ooh. Is DVH going to wear one with me? No, just, just you, <laughs> just me. <laughs> I tell you what, I want if something. We, if we, I want like a good little wager here to, to to see if we can do this. It doesn't have to say Ole Miss on it, does no, it? No, it does not. Okay, it can okay. say prospects. It can say Winslow yeah, squirrels. I, think, I don't know. <laughs> Winslow squirrels. <laughs> yeah, you know what? If we win it all this year, I'll, I'll put one on for you. All right, hey, all right, we're, we're ready for it. We got your questions coming up here on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, but first we're going to get a word from our sponsor, Kendall King. At Kendall King, we're proud of over four (laughs) decades of design. We're continuing the legacy of great creative design by combining our brands of Kendall King, Soapbox, and Shopcart. Together, these brands represent a new focus in marketing design with individual attention to specific areas. Through our design expertise supported by a team of talented professionals, we showcase our best. We are Kendall King. We are Soapbox. We are Shopcart. We are design. All right, we got Bubba on record that he's going to go into powder blue this summer if the Razorbacks uh, finish this run in Omaha. Uh, We're going to go to Blake Sutton now. He's our producer, and uh, he'll read our questions that were submitted on our message boards at wholehogsports.com. All right, first one we have is from Mr. Beeswax. Not a candle maker, by the way. He wanted me to, to tell you that. Not a candle maker. <laughs> Not a candle no. maker. All right. Must be a beekeeper or something. <laughs> uh, his question is, what role does NIL play in hog baseball recruiting, mm-hmm. and how do the Razorbacks stack up in that area versus other major programs? Uh, I don't know how they stack up against 
every program. Uh, it's funny that we're having this conversation because I was talking with someone last night uh, just about Calipari and, and the, you know, the potential maybe for more NIL money in basketball. And, you know, the, it was like baseball apparently gets a lot of NIL money because, you know, people are inter- they're, they're enthusiastic about the team. They're energized by them. I think it's up there. You know, I can't imagine there's a lot of teams out there that are going to, you know, support the players quite like Arkansas do just or, or does because, you know, the, the – just the popularity of the team here, if nothing else. LSU, I think, probably is number one. It would surprise me if they're not, but but I think Arkansas is right there in that upper echelon. I think so. I think, look, I think it's hard to tell Norm DeBryan no. Norm mm-hmm. DeBryan built this program. DVH took it over and taken it to a new level. You can't tell those guys no. I think if DVH got out there, which and I don't, and DVH ain't going to do it. I don't think he needs to do it. But mm-hmm. I think the respect that that fans around the state and all over the country have for Razorback baseball, I think if we needed more money, I think you put it out there, you'd get more money. I really think you do. I think we've got enough right now. But I, I think I think the difference in Arkansas compared to. LSU. I know there was a thing a couple of years ago about a renter player. Mm-hmm. I don't think there's a renter player renter player here at Arkansas. I think guys come here for the culture, for the fans, best fan base in the country, uh, just the culture, the the ability. They all want to play Major League Baseball. Mm-hmm. They know if they come here, they've got a great chance of playing Major League Baseball. I mean, the odds, just the development here, mm-hmm. the culture here that it's more family. It's you know, and I think I think Dave's able to get guys here probably for less money than they would go somewhere else, just because of of the program itself and the culture and the you know we're, I mean we're we're the team to beat. We really are. And they're the only they're the, the show in town. And the the marketability of an Arkansas baseball player I think is is a lot higher than you'll find at most college baseball yeah. programs. Like, all right, you guys kind of touched on this, but Bombastic Hog had a follow up. What are Arkansas's keys adva- key advantages in recruiting? I think it's the building, the or the buildings. People kind of forget about the Fowler Center, but that's a, a really nice indoor facility over there that I think they take great advantage of during the uh, the the rainy cold months, December, January, in, in particular. Uh, but you know, it, I don't know. I think it's a combination probably of the facilities. Uh, and I gotta believe that as Arkansas continues to kind of climb the the ladder in terms of players that are making Major League Baseball, it, it's really accelerated here in the last four or five years. I don't know. There's just something about the combination of the facilities and and that that I think is is appealing to a player who wants to develop and and get to the pros. No, I think so. I think you know. I think I think your really good players see the big picture. Mm. I think some of your prima donnas. Um, I don't know. I'm not even going to start dropping names. I could drop some names on you, but I'm not going to. But I think you're – Phil Elson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think you're good Sorry, players Phil. that see the big picture like your Heston Kerstad. Guys yeah. like that come here because they see, hey, you know, well, Benettini's a perfect example. Benettini came in, was drafted down low, came mm-hmm. in, had a bad freshman year, stayed here, worked, worked out, got stronger, and turned into, mm-hmm. you know – you know, won every award possible, right. and he's played in the big leagues forever. Um, I think people <clears throat> see the big picture, Matt. I really do. I think they they see the development, the Fowler Center, the new Hunt Center, the development over there. I mean, if I'm a pitcher, I want to come here and work with Matt Hobbs mm-hmm. and get better. You know, if I'm a if I'm a if I'm a hitter, I want to come here and work with Nate Thompson, Bobby Warnes. I mean, the technology that we have here. I think it's unmatched. And I think there's a lot of people out there that have all the technology we have, but they don't know how to apply it to specific players. And mm-hmm. I think that's what separates us. I mean, that's the difference right there. You can have all the technology in the world, but if you can't apply it to that player and make him better, it's useless. I say this about the Hunt Center all the time. It reminds me of an SEC football operations building. That's all you need to know. There's a college yeah. baseball building yeah. that is reminiscent of SEC football. That it's It's, it's incredible. Like, all right, next question is from you to man. I'm curious why we let our catcher call the game. Most coaches usually don't trust or like to put that pressure on them. This has been something Arkansas has been doing for a lot of years. Well, I I talked to I talked to Parker Rowland. Um, I talked to him a lot. I talked to all the catchers. When I want to know information, I go to the catchers. Mm-hmm. I really do. Yeah. Um, Casey Opitz. I'd go to Casey Opitz. I went to Michael Turner. I still talk to Michael Turner all the time. We text all the time. Um, 
catchers come here for that reason. Mm -hmm. Parker Rowland came here for the chance to call pitches. That's why good catchers come to Arkansas is because, look, if you're going to play in the big leagues, you have to learn to call a game. Mm -hmm. Coaches don't call the pitches in the big leagues. I mean, that catcher calls the game. They sit down, they go over the scouting report with that pitcher. Now, the pitcher can shake them off occasionally if, you're, if you've got a veteran guy. Same as here. You know, if the, if, if, if the catcher puts down a sign, let's say Brady Tiger's on the mound, and he feels really good with his breaking ball that day, and the catcher puts down fastball, he didn't like it, he can shake. Because you, you want your pitcher committed to that pitch. You don't want him throwing a pitch that he's not committed to. So he can shake, go to the breaking ball, and he throw the breaking ball. But the catcher and, – and every once in a while, I think it's more of a suggestion. I think, I think from the dugout, they'll, they'll make a suggestion, say, hey, don't throw this pitch. Or this is a maybe, what do you think? And mm -hmm. then the catcher still has the chance. And I think it's awesome. And that's how we get – I mean, look, we constantly have stud catchers here. Right now we have four catchers. It's impressive. You know what I think their biggest reason is? I think the catcher has a better feel for the game sitting there on the field than a coach does from the side. Yep. I asked uh, I ask, uh, Parker Rowland about that. I said, hey, when – because I, from when I'm in the booth, you can see a lot from the booth. Mm -hmm. I can tell when a guy's loading late for Will McIntyre's uh, cutter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell. And I asked him, I said, do you, do you see that? And he's like, absolutely. He said, "It's you know, we see it, and therefore we – we call a pitch accordingly. If we know he's sitting off speed the pitch before, we're going to call a, a fastball in. And uh, you're right. They have the best view. Catchers have the best view of everything. You know, they see where the guy's standing in the batter's box. I mean, from the from the dugout, you can't see everything. You can, you can see a lot, but you can't see everything that that catcher can see. And so, I, I, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's awesome that they trust them. Now, every once in a while, they might override them, but not very often. All right, Blake. Okay, next question is from Hog 2009. What makes Will McIntyre so effective? Ooh. Wow. How much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, Dave was referred to it multiple times. When he gets out there on the mound, he's he's mean. And you got to have a little bit of meanness to you. And, and and I've told you before, my dad didn't know a ton about baseball he was more of a football guy mm -hmm. but the one thing he said is you can be tougher than that guy when will mcintyre steps up on the down he knows he's tougher than that guy he's got a little meanness to him a little edge to him but what makes that cutter and his fastball combination so deadly is he's releasing that ball from a six two release point that's six foot two inches and it's coming down into the zone so a lot of guys breaking balls like their cutters will have more horizontal break his has a whole lot more vertical break. So mm. it's coming down at an angle. It looks like it's going to be in the zone, and then all of a sudden it breaks out of the zone. And even if you know it's coming, it's it's hard to hit. Like I, That's another thing I asked Parker Rowland. I said, what does it look like coming into the zone? And he's like, look, it's crazy. He said, he said when we faced him in the fall, he said, I would sit on that pitch and look for it, and I still couldn't hit it. I'd roll over it. And that's when you know it's a really nasty pitch is when you look for it, sit on it, and you still miss it. All right, Blake, last one. Okay, final question is from Danny. Do the Hogs have a switch hitter on the roster, and is this a skill DVH tries to develop? Parker Rowland is the only one I can think of. Yeah, he's the only switch hitter. As far as DVH developing him, I don't think he really cares. Mm -hmm. I think he's got so many guys that he can mix and match with. Mm -hmm. I don't think – I don't think if you're a switch hitter, it really matters. You know, look at the last – what was the last good switch hitter we had uh, before Parker Rowland? We had Robert Moore. Mm -hmm. Robert was way better from the left side. I mean, he was – that's where his power came from. Right side, he was more of a spray hitter. Um, you know, didn't hit near as well from the, the right side as the left. I don't think Dave really cares. I think he really just looks for good players. If they can switch hit, maybe that's a bonus. But, I mean, there's – a whole lot of really good players that have come here through here that that aren't switch hitters. But what he has the luxury of is, is matching up. He can go lefty, righty. You know, if they if if we're facing someone that's got a really good lefty and the splits don't work out and lefties don't hit him well, he can load the lineup up with righties and vice versa. When it comes to righties versus lefties, if if uh, righties struggle with a right-handed matchup, we can load that lineup up with lefties. And I think that's all Dave cares about. Casey Opitz was a switch hitter. I'm, I'm having trouble thinking of like a really great switch hitter that's played at Arkansas in the last several years. 
You know, Casey was another one, better from the left side mm-hmm. than the right. And that, that's um, kind of the that's kind of been the story with him. You've yeah. you've got one side where you're really good from. But I will say, if you're a catcher that can switch hit, you know, I, I've talked to Parker about it multiple times. It's Parker's having a hard time getting in the lineup right now. But mm-hmm. a guy that can switch hit, if you're a catcher that catches well, that can switch hit, you can play this game for a long time. If if you're good behind the dish and you're just you're just serviceable at the plate. You can just get it done a little bit at the plate. You can play this game a long time. You played in 1989 at Arkansas, is that right? Yep. Okay, so they broke a record by that team last night, a record that was actually shared between the 89 and the 85 teams, the longest home winning streaks in season at Arkansas. They won their 22nd in a row at Baumwalker Stadium. Previously, the end season record was 21 in a row from the 89 team and the 85 team over at the old George Cole. I say end season because there's actually a longer winning streak that spans two years, 84 and 85, a 27 game winning streak. They're getting awfully close to that. What do you think the key is to to playing well at home? Uh, baseball players are creatures of habit. Um, I think they just feel good at home. I think the bomb walker crowd plays into that. To be honest with you, I think they feed off that crowd. They've and had I think good crowds this year. Yeah, it's been awesome. And I think other teams, it affects their pitching. I'm telling you, our fans know. uh, They know when to get on an opposing pitcher. And I call it the pucker factor. (laughs) They get on that pitcher, and and you can see them. And they start to, you know, kind of short arm the ball. They start to stiffen up. They leave stuff over the middle of the plate. But I think that's a big part of it. But the main part is it's just baseball players are creatures of habit. So they have their routine that they go through. They get mm-hmm. to the stadium at a certain time. They've got all the stuff that they can do. We're on the road. That's all disrupted because you're in a hotel. Food's different. Everything about it's different. And, look, you've been in the Hunt Center, the Fowler Center. These guys have it pretty good at home. So mm-hmm. it's hard not to be happy at home. Significance of sweeping Ole Miss. It's the first time that Arkansas had swept Ole Miss since Norm DeBryan's last year as coach. Wow. I didn't know that. that I should have known that. I mean, Bianco and Van Horn have coached against each other 80 times now, and they were, they've always been competitive series. You know, it it feels like kind of the the prototypical Arkansas Ole Miss series is it's 1 1 going into game three, and then game three is an absolute just brawl. You never know what you're going to get in that game. A little bit different, you know, this week, but it's it's been so competitive. It it surprised me, but then again, it didn't surprise me so much because Ole yeah, Miss has had Arkansas's number a lot up until the last five years or so. Right. You know the difference in this Ole Miss team. I mean, just think about if you watch them play. First of all, they have a freshman shortstop and a freshman catcher. Mm. Now, I don't know. For me, when I think of Ole Miss baseball, I think of a stud shortstop and a really good catcher. Mm-hmm. And you got to be strong up the middle, obviously. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, they had, a, they had a freshman shortstop and a freshman catcher. Now, Lines was really good behind the plate. Didn't swing it very well, but I think he's going to be a really good one. I love the way he moved behind the plate. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't see that from Ole Miss, and they're just not as big, strong, physical team. Like, I watched our guys take BP, and I know it's just BP, and I talk about it a lot. You see a lot in BP, though. The balls we hit off the bat in BP – is nothing like what Ole Miss was hitting, mm. or vice versa. You can say it the opposite way. What The way they were hitting the ball versus the way we hit the ball, two different things. It, I mean, our balls, we are hammering balls in PP. We're bigger, stronger, more physical. And that's the thing that I've seen out of Ole Miss teams in the past. They're big, strong, physical teams. They just didn't – they don't have that same err that, hmm. that I've seen out of them in the past. Now, they got some young guys in there. They might develop in a year or two, and who knows. I mean, they're not a bad team. I mean, they showed some fight on Sunday, but yeah. – you know, we just – we made plays, we made pitches, and we got big hits we needed. Remember Tony Vitello's last year here, they had the Hulkamania shirts that, you know, somebody who was like the batting champion from the day before got to wear during BP. Yeah. You know where I'm going with yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. You, so you said the guy from Ole Miss, and they had like kind of a neon yellow greenish type shirt. <laughs> Looked awfully good with those powder blue pants in yeah. BP on Saturday. <laughs> We'll move on. Yes, please. <laughs> I thought the outfield defense was phenomenal, especially I think it was game two, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, was that when you had Wilmsmeyer throughout the runner at third? Kendall Diggs had a diving catch. I thought Will Edmondson's catch up against the fence in left field was underrated. I mean, running full speed, held onto the ball as you know he knew he was going to take a, a, a pretty big blow there, right in front of the bullpen. Let's talk about Wilmsmeyer's throw though. Uh, I was sitting with, uh, oh gosh. Uh, Ron, uh, he was on the 69 Mets. Who am I? Who am I? Well, I'll, I'll remember his name here in a minute. He used to call Arkansas games. Uh, but anyway, he played for the 69 Mets, the Miracle Mets. And I remember I was watching a game with him one time, 
and he was uh, pointing out, you know, watch how the the outfielder sets his feet before he catches the ball right. and throws toward the base. And it's just these little things like that that I thought Wilmsmeyer on the front end made a great, great job of, of positioning his body to throw to third base. But then I was also really impressed with Spraglot at third. He stood there like a statue until the second yeah. that ball got there. The base runner had no idea the ball was coming, and, and that probably played a little bit of a factor in a bang bang play. Yeah, I, Jared Lott, he, Jared Sprague Lott, you give him credit. He really did hide that well. I think he'd have been out regardless, but he did a good job of deking the runner. But that was a clinic in how to get behind the ball. You talk about the footwork, it's so important, Matt. Like right there, like, like when I watch, like, like I video my guys all the time, mm. all levels of baseball. I video them feeling a fly ball, you know, right, left throw. How quick do you feel that ball? and get rid of it and put it on the bag. So if you take one extra step right there, he's safe. And, I mean, it was just a clinic of Wilsmark getting behind that ball, getting his momentum going through the ball. Had he caught it flat-footed, guy's safe, not even close. But he got momentum coming through and was able to able to make a perfect throw. Not only was everything perfect about it, he put it right on the bag. Great catch, great tag by, by Jared Sprague lot. I mean, it was just a clinic. Now, to your point – the ball in left field. I agree. Wilsmar or uh, um, Edmondson. Edmondson made a great play on that. I mean, he really did, and hit the wall going back. There were multiple plays. Diggs is playing right field. Mm -hmm. um, I'll tell you, Vahava Aloy, really good backhand play on a ball top spun really hard. Came up and make a good throw on it. Uh, made it look easy. There were multiple, multiple plays in that game that you know Diggs is ball down the right field line. I thought it was fair foul. Umpire called it fair. That gets by him and bounces to the wall. That's a that's a double at least, triple, maybe more. Who knows? But uh, yeah, just some really good defensive plays. Wilmsmeyer, that's two times by the way. We've seen him make a really good throw from the outfield this year. I asked him what his arm was like in the preseason. He said, I, "I've been told it's average. I think it's a little bit better than average." Yeah, I think it's average. very accurate. I think it's. I think he gets rid of it quick. First of all, his footwork's quick. He gets rid of it quick, and he puts it right on the bag. Mm. Now, in pregame, you know, I think Dave referred to it. He doesn't really show it off in pregame, but watch. Next time we take in and out, he puts it. It's a one-hop throw right on the bag. Like, as an outfielder, the worst thing you do, you don't want to short hop your fielder. If I'm mm -hmm. throwing it to third base from right field, I don't want to short hop him. I want to give him a good long hop that he's got time to catch it and make the tag. Um, Will Smart's perfect every time. Mm -hmm. I mean, his his throws are dead on. And then when he wants to, he can unleash the cannon a little bit and let it go. And that's what he did. That's what he did that day. I was on Joe Healy's D one baseball podcast this week and and you know, he was asking me some stuff about this team. And I can't remember exactly what the question was, but it was basically like what what's a term that describes Arkansas? And uh I said respondability. Uh, but then I also said team. They're just they're just a team. You don't yeah. know who's gonna you don't know who's going to stand out from one day to the next. But you have a good feeling that somebody's going to make the play that that wins them the game. That that's why they're twenty eight and three right now. But the ability by some of these players to be ready when their name is called is what really stands out to me. And I've I've written down here, Gage Wood. He was mm -hmm. and he was good again last night. Uh, but he was really good against Ole Miss, probably the best that we've seen him. He was good against Arkansas State last week. Uh, best stretch of, of, of pitching that I think we've seen from Gage Wood here lately. Stone Hewlett, every time he comes in, he gets out. Well, he's retired 13 in a row. He hasn't allowed a base runner since March 12th against Oral Roberts. Now, a lot of times it's just one batter. Sometimes it's three. Last night it was five. But he's getting the job done. Nolan Souza comes off the bench, or, right. you know, as, as a pinch hitter. Some games he's a, a DH on on Saturday against Ole Miss, and you can just go on and on. Christian Fouts is another one who I was thinking of is is uh, that uh, came to my mind after I wrote this. There's just so many players that are ready when their name is called, and they're doing, a, you know, a small part that contributes to something a lot bigger. So when you're talking to Joe Healy, did. Had he ever heard your respondability term before? Well, we actually went to lunch when he was in Fayetteville a couple of weeks ago, and I'd I'd mentioned that to him. So yes. So 
but before that, like, is that is that a Matt Jones term? Like, do we need to credit you? Like, like Phil's. I got, would hate Phil's so, got fair poll. So I would. Everyone yeah, I knows that, Phil. By the way, oh my gosh, it drives me crazy. And <laughs> DVH called it a fair. Oh, he called it a foul poll. Then he called it a fair poll. You were in the press conference. Did he? Did he smirk just a little bit when a he said, bit. "Okay"? It was like he knew what he was doing. Uh, he knew exactly yeah. what he was doing. And oh my gosh, Phil's victory lap on that never <laughs> ended. Uh, it went on and on. He's still running. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I would hate to say yes, I came up with it, and somebody comes along and says, "Hey, I tweeted that at you in 2014 or something." I don't know if I came up with it, but it's a word that's just kind of been stuck in my head for the last three or four weeks as I've watched this team. Yeah, I like it. I've given you props a couple times on the air for responsibility, so I like it. I appreciate that. Yeah. What were we talking about? I have no. We're idea. talking about players who are ready. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about players who are ready when their name's called. Yeah. Okay. So. For me, that goes back to DVH. It, it really does. So I say all the time, as a as a good head coach, I, I think good good coaches, like I try to do it with my younger guys, and I do it with my when I'm coaching my high school showcase guys. I think you coach them from the inside out. Like you mm. you know you know what's inside a player. Mm-hmm. So you know if you call on Souza to go up and pinch hit in the eighth inning, um, you know what you're going to get. Um, uh, Reese last year. Mm-hmm. Reese gets the big home run against um, uh, LSU. Yeah, Third right. Inning. I mean, that was a huge. That was a huge swing right there in that game. Won us the game. DVH knew to go to him right there. I mean, I, I think a lot of it is just Dave knowing what's inside a player, kind of coaching from the inside out, and hey, he uh, he pulls the right strings. But then the players go in there and execute. So I like it. You know, my favorite part of being live is <laughs> you're laughing about something. <laughs> something's going on. <laughs> I just got an email from your wife of you in a baby blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, see, I look good all cleaned up, don't I? <laughs> I wish we could get this on the air. Can we see that on camera? <laughs> oh, I don't think we can see it on camera. You can uh, flip it around. If maybe you we want. can. I'm not scared. Here, I'm, I'm going to send this to Blake. We'll see if Blake can like put it up on the board here behind us while we're is, finishing up. Is that the bear in the background? I have no idea. <laughs> it's a bear. It's from a. It's, it's from a Branson. It's a Big Cedar Lodge. I used to have dreams about bears, and we don't even want to go down this wormhole right now. I used to have <laughs> dreams about bears, so it's kind of it's kind of cool that the bears in the background. We'll we'll see if oh that is a bear. I, I see it now. We'll save that for another podcast. We'll, we'll see if Blake can get that up on the screen here behind us while we finish. <laughs> Alabama this weekend. Alabama's twenty two and eleven. They got off to a great start. It seems like kind of a typical Alabama team. I don't know that they schedule great, and and so there's probably a little bit of a I don't know if false hope is the right word, but you know they get off to these great starts, and then they get into SEC play, and they don't play real well, and that's kind of been uh, the case this year. They did start SEC play really well. They beat Tennessee two out of three, uh, but after that, I don't know. And I don't know that Tennessee is really as, as good as their record. I'm not sure the SEC is as good this year, top to bottom, as it's been in previous years. I still think there's a lot of really good teams. I'm just talking about you know one through 14. A lot of times you feel like there might be – 11 tournament teams. I don't know if it's quite like that this year. Uh, it's hard to say. The, I think the talent's there. I, I think, okay, so we're in a new era of baseball, and you bring all these guys in. And once again, I'm going to brag on DVH for bringing the right players in. You bring all these prima donnas in. You give them all this NIL money. A lot of them are playing for the name on the, the back of the jersey, not the name on the front. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So I think – I think it takes a while to get a team to come together, and I think that's what you're seeing with some of these teams that bring in all these studs from these other places, and they throw them all together and say, okay, go play ball. DVA shouldn't do that. He brings in the right player. So, you know, during the fall, they learn how to play Razorback baseball, and mm-hmm. therefore we start the season, we have success. I think it's about bringing in the right guys. But you look at – I look at Alabama at home. They seem to be a different team. Their numbers are completely different at home. They go yep. on the road. They get swept by Georgia on the road. They got crushed by Kentucky last mm-hmm. week. I watched I watched Kentucky's some of that. Kentucky's 11-1 in the I SEC. I, I mean, I don't, and I don't I have a hard time believing that they're a championship contender. I, I do too. But see, Kentucky gets off to a hot start a lot, mm-hmm. and then they just kind of – fizzle at the end now they're I think they their tougher teams are coming up I mm-hmm. think down the road but you know you look at Georgia I mean you look at getting swept by Georgia Alabama did uh they won the series against South Carolina at home won two out of three and then they got killed by by Kentucky last week so who knows what they're gonna get at home I just think they're they're a different team at home and I think they're gonna be hungry for wins and they always seem to play as well at 
at home. So mm-hmm. we'll, we'll see. I think it's going to be a good test for us. You got your Alabama cheat sheet there. What stands out to you about Crimson Tide? Um, yeah, I don't know. They're they're average. Their their offensive numbers are better than ours, but then most of the teams we've played have been, you know, our offensive numbers don't pop out at you. You have to really get inside the numbers and 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 look to say, okay, mm-hmm. this is why we're eleven and one right here. But pitching wise, I mean, we're dominant mm-hmm. pitching wise. I mean, we're way I mean, you know, their their Ernie's five eleven, ours is two five six. Um but I think if you if you get into the offensive numbers and you just look at it at a glance, they're like, wow, they're out hitting us. They're they're way up there. Um but it's our timely hitting that gets it done. And that's something that you can't really put a there's, there's not an analytic. Well, I mean, there's runners in scoring position, bad. I mean, but you know mm-hmm. what I mean? There's just a, I don't know. It's just, it's our ability to answer back that we talked about earlier that's not on this, this spreadsheet. Or, you know, when another team makes an error, what do we do to capitalize on that error? And I think that's something that's not in the stats. But, you know, uh, pitching wise, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, we're dominating them in strikeouts. You know, walks. I mean, I mean, across the board. I mean, we're, we're dominating everyone when it comes to pitching. We know they probably don't have a great NIL program for baseball because all their best players get taken away by other teams. You know, yeah. Luke Holman was there last year. Yeah. Now he's at LSU. Colby Shelton uh, was an outstanding freshman for them last year. Now he's at Florida. Ben Hess is back. Hess is a, a guy that we've seen in some Arkansas games in the past. That's probably going to be the game one matchup against Hagen Smith, unless they pitch off or something. But what do you remember about him? Uh, he's got good stuff. Um, I went back and looked at his starts, and he's had a few good starts mm-hmm. that they've won. And then on the road, he's had some really bad starts. So who knows what you're going to get. But I think the fact that we've seen him before, uh, we know what he's going to throw at us. I, I think he's the type of pitcher that, that our offense will do well against. I really do. Blake, we got the picture? I've got the picture of Bubba, baby blue carpet. All right, I think it's going to come up behind us <laughs> here. No, okay. it's going to be in your oh, It's going to be on the screen. Okay, <laughs> yeah. here it is. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Look at that. Look at me all cleaned up. you never seen me cleaned up before, have you? That's no. a good pick. <laughs> There's the bear. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. <laughs> it's great being live. You know, I was on a Tulsa radio station this week. They asked me to come on and talk about John Calipari. And uh, I don't know. I'm supposed to be on there about 105. About 111 rolls around. My phone hadn't rang. And I text him, and I say, Hey, uh, are you still calling? Yeah, hold on just a minute. Well, they call. It's the Pat Jones Show. Pat Jones, who was the, the former coach over at Oklahoma State. And uh, I get on there. There's a Matt Jones who covers Kentucky basketball. And oh, they had no. called him. <laughs> and it just so happened that we were covering the same thing this week. And, uh, you know, it took them a few minutes to feel, figure out they had the wrong Matt Jones on. So <laughs> apparently made pretty good live radio over in Tulsa this week. So there's something really fun about being live. Yeah, I like it. I, I'm, I'm glad. I've, I've got one fan out there. So love you, Crystal. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Crystal, thank you for watching. And we appreciate everybody else for watching here on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Be back next week. We'll talk about the Alabama series. Also, uh, they got another road series following that to South Carolina. Interesting stretch here for Arkansas. Uh, the next uh, few games, Alabama, home series against Texas Tech in the midweek, and then off to South Carolina again. I think it'll tell us a lot about this baseball team, uh, what we see over the next eight games or so. Hope you come to wholehogsports.com this weekend to read all about our baseball coverage, uh, whether it be San Jose State, whether it be Alabama, and uh, we may have a story or two about John Calipari there too. We'll see you at wholehogsports.com. We'll see you next week. For Bob Carpenter, I'm Matt Jones. Thanks, everybody. Go Hogs. Thanks to Kendall King, where their design talents are showcased by teamwork. Kindle King, Shop Cart, and Soapbox. They're your design professionals with home run stats.